community-based organization or type of event. And it's ha I'm happy to see that so many of you have showed up physically. We have people as well joined online. So thanks to all of you out there, wherever you sit. It's appreciated that we can have this opportunity to actually live streaming this event today. Um, there will be an opportunity during today as well to speak out loud and ask questions. And for that, we have this microphone that we will throw to you when you have a question so the people online can follow what you ask as well. Practical things like if you need to have a break, it's out here. If you want to raise a question, please take your hand up and we will figure out how to uh, arrange. So next thing is that I will give a quick introduction to Elastic, what it is, uh, and then we will hand over to Dinino group to actually give a real use case presentation or a sneak peek into how they use it. And then we will take a deeper dive into two different use cases, uh, observability and security, where my colleague Mikkel, who sits over here, solution architect, he will give a present, short presentation, but a demo of the two uh, solutions. Before we start and, and show a few slides, how many of you in this room at least are already using Elastic today? So almost all of you, that's great to see. How many of you are using it on version five? One? All of them. You use all of them, perfect. So five, six, seven? I assume that's, that's the rest then. That's great to see how many of you are on seven, six? One? or maybe a few more, seven, five. All right, so it seems like you're, you're all above seven, which is great, which is our latest uh, major release. Um, we'll talk about some of the features uh, today that are only available in seven dot something. So that's great to see that at least you are, you are close to being there. Elastic was a company founded in 2012. It's a company that started out as a search technology for recipes because our founder's wife is a chef and it was a struggle for her to actually navigate in the space of recipes. So he thought while he was looking to advance his competences in developing, why not try to perform something for her? Maybe he could impress her. And uh, today we have Elastic as you know it. It's a search technology that you can use for many other search use cases and also other use cases in general. But I'll talk about why do we see Elastic as, if this one will work, Elastic as a search company. So for Elastic, it's not only about typing into a bar that is related to search. Search is much more than that. It is about combining different data sources that you can search across where you look for something. That is what search is about for us. I'll give you just a quick introduction to three use cases that most of you are familiar with already today. So you can relate to for those who are maybe new to it, but also for those of you who already use Elastic that you can see how can you use Elastic maybe differently. One that you are probably all familiar with is more an international global company, Uber, but locally you are more familiar with Taxify or Bold as they're called today, also using Elastic. Uber in particular, the way they use it, that's what we can talk about. When you do want to have a match in between a passenger and a driver, the technology that behind combines those two is elastic. So it's, it's a relative complex query where you want to combine one person's location with a future location where you want to be transported to, the driver being a moving object and combining all that, that is what elastic can do as well. How many of you knows of Activision Blizzard? None? A few? Ah, oh, there are some of you there. <laughs> if you're gating a bit, it's more fun for everyone. But yeah, Activision Blizzard, they actually use Elastic to monitor their gaming community. So for those of you who don't know, it's a gaming company offering online streaming of gaming. So if you do play a game online and you're in that community and you pay for it, you also would expect that your service is actually working and it won't crash while you're just about to win a game. 
that's where they use Elastic to actually monitor that their service globally has an uptime that is sufficient to what they promise, but also for the experience of the gamers, which is the most important for them. That it crashes, it might be okay for a gamer, but if you're in a big tournament, it might not. So that's why this is important for them. Taking one step further, it is evening, so we can talk about Tinder as well. You might know of it, some of you might have even tried it. It's also a matchmaking platform, a dating platform, some would say. It's also a relatively complex matchmaking process that happens here because it's about geolocations, it's about personal preferences, pictures, etc., all coming together inside one platform. That is all supported by Elastic. One other use case that Tinder also uses Elastic for, and that's what we're talking more about later today with Mikkel, is security. Tinder is actually using Elastic for security, analytics, and monitoring the platform. So if any of you may use or having friends that uses Tinder, then you can be safe that they sit behind the screens and they actually look into what is happening on the platform to protect their users' data. Taking one step further, why Elastic for security or why Elastic for, that's the topic of today, that's why it is listed here, but it's the same for search. What is it that is so characteristic about Elastic? And that is that the technology itself is developed for speed, for scale, and for relevance. All those in combination is what is super relevant when you want to search and you want to, as a user, or if it's private or commercial, you want to have relevance and you want to be able to do it at massive scale. We had a question earlier today, but how small can it actually fit? There isn't actually really a small or a big limitation to how you can use Elastic. It's more about up to you as if you're a developer or you work with a developer to figure out what is actually right for you because the technology can support both smaller local commercial, let's say e-commerce, but it can also support eBay, which ingests petabytes of data into Elasticsearch. In Elastic, we have developed over time three solutions, all based on the open source stack that most of you are probably familiar with today, which is Kibana for visualization and uh, monitoring, and it's our management interface. Then we have Elasticsearch itself, which is our data store and analytics engine. And below that, that's where we talk about ingest, where we have the beats available, where you can gather information from sources and put them directly into Elasticsearch. And then via Kibana, you can modulate it and you can uh, visualize it, etc. Then we have Logstash, where you can enrich the data. That is the stack itself. And with time, we have seen that many users, they have particular preferences or particular use cases that are more predominant. And as a company, we have a strong desire for serving the community. And we said, OK, why can we then not give to you some of these solutions pre-configured inside Kibana? That's what you see here. Those three major solution areas, they're built for this purpose. And on, on the left, we have uh, enterprise search, where we have three different uh, search solutions in there. It's site search, app search, and something called workplace search. Other companies also call that enterprise search. That's basically where you can search across any information, any file that you have may have stored in Dropbox, Google Drive, or even on your local uh, storage setup. Then observability, that's where we see the most use cases actually, which is for logging. We see uh, application performance monitoring in this space, and then metrics and uptime. That is observability. Latest, we have announced uh, last year, we introduced, after a long time, we have worked with security companies, why then not offer a CM solution out of Kibana? So that was uh, announced and launched last year. It's generally available today. So we have a relatively high cadence of keeping up with our releases. A minor is released every six to eight weeks, and a major once to twice per year. So the CM is one of the security offerings that we have today out of Kibana. Latest, we have acquired an endpoint security, if some of you may know what that is, endpoint security company, which is then 
going to be integrated into Kibana over time. So the endpoint security solution combined with the SIEM, then you have all that data and you can do the endpoint protection, but you can also do the threat detection inside the SIEM solution. That's mostly these two that we are going to talk more about today when Mikkel will demo those parts later on. I think that was more or less it that I will talk about uh, for now. It was a high level introduction, a bit what we talked about, the stack itself, these three solutions that we have developed on top of it. With that said, I will give the word to Andre and he will give you an introduction to how to the Nino Group actually is using Elastic today. Uh, my name is Andre Vashen and I'm, I'm a CEO of uh, uh, Danina Group and I am responsible here for all uh, technology related uh, activities uh, including uh, technology strategy and leading of uh, IT team. First of all I would like to welcome uh, everyone here uh, who come personally here and uh, those who are watching us uh, uh, who are watching our live streaming on, you, on, on YouTube, so thank you for uh, coming, guys. And, uh, of course, special thanks uh, and special greetings comes to uh, Mikhail and uh, Thomas, so the guys from, uh, from uh, Elastic. It's actually the first time when uh, uh, the team that is behind the open source Elastic uh, stack comes to uh, Riga. Uh, as uh, Thomas said, we, we here at Dynina uh, use uh, some products from Elastic and I will, I will, I will show you a couple of examples, examples of the use and uh, because of that we are very happy to, uh, to host this event and thank you uh, one more time guys for, for coming. Yep. Uh, so as I said, uh, Elastic products uh, are the part of uh, our technology stack here at Dynina, and I will show a couple of examples how we use it, but let me start with uh, uh, just a very short introduction. Uh, what is Dynina actually uh, is about? Right? Uh, Dynina uh, is a group of international companies. Uh, the company has been operating since 2004. And uh, here we have uh, three businesses or there are three industries where we are active. The first one and the largest one is travel. Uh, here in travel, uh, we actually sell air tickets. And our uh, focus uh, or expertise and specializations, not just uh, uh, such cases like direct flight from one point to another, but uh, we actually are focused on some complex cases when uh, your journey consists of, uh, consists of different uh, connections uh, and you would like to visit uh, a number of locations along the way uh, to your final destination. Uh, the second uh, industry uh, is FinTech. We actually started to be active uh, in, in, in such area uh, five years ago only. So it's the youngest actually uh, uh, business direction for us. And currently, uh, here we um, provide uh, different kind of, uh, uh, of uh, credit products, uh, so like a credit line on consumer loans and microcredit, of course. Yeah, and our vision here uh, to expand the scope of uh, financial and banking products we provide and finally become a digital bank. And the third uh, business direction is entertainment, or uh, as we call it, casting. Uh, here we provide services that match uh, supporting actors or actors in uh, episodes and uh, film producers and film directors. Directors. You can think about such, such services and uh, products like uh, niche social network uh, where, where the ones are looking for others. Uh, all those uh, business directions or companies uh, provide service, services globally. Just for example, uh, the main market for travel is uh, United States. Casting works with Hollywood and with uh, Canadian uh, film producers. Uh, FinTech operates in uh, Russia and in some countries uh, around uh, Europe. And here in Riga we have a company, uh, Dynatech, which actually provide uh, IT services for all those three businesses. 
So those IT services are uh, software development, uh, maintaining of server infrastructure, network infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, 12 offices all around the world, so maintaining of these office, offices also uh, uh, happens from here, from Riga, from this uh, building. Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, the company is global. Yep, so 12 offices all around the world. We have office, offices in North America, in uh, South America, in Colombia. Uh, offices all around uh, Europe, UK, Romania, Latvia, of course, and uh, Russia, uh, Moldova. We have even office in uh, uh, Africa, in uh, Cairo. Then there are a couple offices in Asia, in uh, the Philippines. And the youngest office we just launched uh, last October is located in New Delhi, uh, in uh, India. And uh, here are some facts about our company. So we operate uh, in more than 50 uh, markets, more than 50 countries. To do that, my colleagues speak uh, 12 languages. Um, to provide our services, we have our own call centers. And in uh, those call centers, more than uh, 2,000 uh, 1,000, sorry, uh, 200 uh, agents work for us. Uh, here in Riga, uh, our IT team consists of uh, more than 200 uh, specialists. And uh, the team is growing. We have open positions. So just visit dynatech.lv to check what kind of positions we have. And also, uh, there are about 400 uh, my colleagues from other departments like uh, marketing, uh, accounting, uh, HR, PR, and others. Uh, some facts about our technologies. Um, everything we uh, develop, I mean, uh, develop software, uh, we do in-house. So we don't, do not outsource uh, uh, software development uh, to external companies. And here we have about 150 uh, different kind of projects. Uh, from small, tiny microservices to quite large uh, CRM systems. Uh, our server infrastructure consists of uh, more than 200 servers, and uh, it's growing. Uh, we actually uh, mostly uh, host our servers on Amazon, AWS. Uh, and uh, we use, uh, actually, a wide number of uh, different programming languages, the main language for us. Here is PHP, but we have uh, solutions written in Java, in JavaScript, Node.js, and Python, uh, and others. As I said, uh, we have our own call centers. There are seven. And they use uh, solution, web solution written again here in this company based on uh, Asterisk and FreeSwitch. And our agents, uh, in a normal day, they make uh, 2,030, uh, sorry, 230,000 uh, calls in a normal day. And uh, in peak hours, they actually speak with uh, about 16,000 uh, clients per hour. Uh, also, I would like to mention uh, that we have uh, our own analytics system. Uh, it's... Uh, serves about 7 million events per hour uh, in peak hours. And uh, every day, uh, 150 uh, gigabytes of data, of new data comes. And uh, uh, the analytic system actually is able to, 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 to process the data and store the data for the further uh, analysis. This actually mostly it about uh, the company itself the holding itself, yeah. And now I would like to share with you some, just a couple examples of uh, uh, the usage of uh, the Elastic products uh, here at Dynina. Uh, mostly we use Elastic products to cover those two domains, security monitoring and uh, log management. In case of security monitoring, we, uh, with the help of Elastic products, we, uh, we are trying to detect uh, attempts of fraud. Also, we monitor unauthorized access uh, to our systems. 
and uh, we monitor access to our the most critical uh, data. In case of log management, uh, actually nothing new here. So we use classical model of log management. Yeah. So we have centralized uh, storage for log for for our logs and events from applications uh, to be able to dig uh, among those uh, logs uh, to make search. And also we create, uh, uh, sometimes we create reports based on data from those logs. Let me show how we do it. And let, let's start, start from uh, monitoring. Uh, first of all, we use different protocols uh, how to deliver data to Elasticsearch. Uh, for example, in case of uh, our database servers, we use FileBit to deliver logs from our database server to, to uh, ELK. Then in case of uh, there is syslog. Uh, syslog we use uh, to deliver data from operating systems and from different um, um, appliances like uh, network devices like switches, routers, et cetera. Where, uh, from devices where uh, are you not able to install bits, for example, yeah? So there is a syslog and this is it. So Logstash supports syslog, we use syslog there. And also uh, in some places we use even HTTP protocol to deliver some events from our applications to ELK stack. Also, it's worth to mention that uh, uh, here you see we use Logstash, so we do, do not uh, send data directly to Elasticsearch. And there is a reason because uh, Logstash uh, can transform your data. And in case of security monitoring, for example, we don't need all the data from, from, from logs we send. So by Logstash, we extract only necessary data. And additionally with that, sometimes we need to enrich uh, enrich our events, and again, Logstash uh, helps us with that. I will show you later how actually how how it's done. Then Logstash uh, stores uh, data to Elasticsearch, and we use Kibana uh, for visual, vi visualization. So Logstash, as I said, uh, Logstash can transform your data. Uh, there is a, a plugin in Logstash. I mean, plugin ecosystem. Uh, so I know there are about 200 uh, different plugins that's already written and ready to use. Uh, so we, we use this mechanism. This particular piece of code uh, actually calculates uh, fraud score of the events. We have a set of keywords. And uh, in every ev event we are looking for, uh, and every keyword actually has uh, its own fraud score. So when, when we get an event from application, we are looking for those keywords in case we find some keywords or maybe, I don't know, a few keywords. We just add the fraud score to the event. And then uh, we are able to, uh, to create such kind of reports to check uh, on just, it just example dashboard. On, on the top, you, you see fraud score by day. Yep, from all the events. And then on the bottom, uh, you can see the top of uh, the most uh, popular uh, those keywords we found in, uh, in, 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 in those events. Uh, yeah, and also I mentioned about, about syslog and about uh, uh, logs from operating system and from, from network devices. Actually, uh, because we, we send those uh, logs to, to Eelcastec, we are able to uh, monitor some suspicious activities, uh, just for example, like uh, brute force SSH uh, attacks. Yeah? And we can, uh, we can uh, recognize uh, from what IP addresses those attacks uh, are performed, uh, which hosts are affected, which usernames uh, are used to, to, uh, I don't know, to, to log into our systems. And also, uh, I put those uh, examples of visualization uh, because Elasticsearch has uh, geo uh, types of data, like uh, data point, like city and country. And uh, Kibana has such a nice uh, visualization as Elastic Map, so we can 
put those uh, uh, events uh, or logs we, we uh, get from application to, to new maps and uh, we are able to see uh, those attempts on, from, on the map. Yep, so quite nice uh, visualization. Uh, yep, yeah. and let's move on to log management. Uh, here uh, we also use, uh, uh, we, we send uh, logs and events from our applications to Logstash again. Uh, but here, as you see, we use uh, FluentD. I don't know who are familiar with FluentD. Yeah, it's data collector, quite popular, and uh, it uses its own protocol, Fluent, to deliver data. The reason of that, uh, because we, um, we actually just started to migrate to Yale Castec, uh, I mean migrate log management, just a few months ago, and our previous log management actually, uh, I mean delivery of logs for previous log management was based on FluentD. So we decided not to change uh, this approach at the first stage, and especially when we discovered that Logstash actually has support uh, fluent protocol. So we decided not to change this approach at the first stage. Later on, maybe, I don't know, we will change uh, these collectors uh, to file bits or whatever, but currently as it is. And here, uh, again, we uh, send uh, events and the logs to Logstash. And here we use Logstash not only for transforming data, but for delivering data to different destinations. As you see here, we store data to Amazon S3, so block storage from Amazon, for further archiving the data. And in parallel of that, of par parallel of that we, use, we send uh, logs to Elasticsearch for further analysis of the logs. And here in Elastic Stack, uh, we implemented uh, this um, architecture, hot uh, warm cold architecture. Elasticsearch has uh, um, built-in uh, retention, uh, retention mechanism. It's called it uh, index life cycle, life cycle policy. So we use uh, this mechanism and it works like, like, like this. So um, the logs for today, they are the most uh, heavily searched. And they are coming all the time. Yep, that means uh, to be able to, to make search among those logs, you need to uh, all the time re-index uh, or recreate, the, recreate indexes. Uh, and that means that the, the best way, as you know, as we know, uh, the, the, I don't know, the, the most uh, performance storage uh, is uh, RAM, it's operating memory. Yeah, so that means that if you have a lot of data and we have uh, about 200 gigabytes every day data coming, so that means that you will need um, a huge amount of RAM. So, and this is actually what hot set in our case is about. So uh, we store here data only for one, for one day. We use for that uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, expensive uh, setup. Uh, hot set uh, consists of um, input-output uh, optimized uh, instances from Amazon. Uh, which uses NVM storage. Uh, yep. And uh, here we are able to, to store uh, 200 gigabytes of data and the uh, searches among this hot uh, set uh, are performed uh, less than 10 seconds. So every search uh, results of, from, from search we can get less uh, than in, uh, 10 seconds. Then there is a warm, uh, warm uh, set uh, it consists of uh, just generic instances from Amazon, M5 or whatever, uh, with just standard magnetic uh, drives. And here we are able to store 30 days, last 30 days of data. Uh, in our case, it's about three, three terabytes. And searches among uh, this uh, particular set return results uh, from 50 to 100 seconds, some, something like that. And then we have uh, cold storage, which consists actually from burstable uh, instances with uh, EBS cold uh, volumes. It's actually the cheapest setup Amazon provides. Yeah, and here we, we, we store the rest, the rest of the data for, for the last uh, six months. 
And you see here that uh, in the cold storage, we still have less data than in warm because, as I said, so we just started, uh, I don't know, three maybe months ago to, to, to send logs here. So this is the reason. And then, of course, we use uh, Kibana for different kinds of visualizations. Kibana has a quite nice and quite rich uh, set of uh, different visualizations. Donut chart, bars, and uh, line chart. Uh, I already showed you those uh, maps. Yeah, so here, just for example, yeah, we are able to see uh, status codes from our uh, web servers, errors, uh, traffic. Uh, also, I don't know, some tables use Kibana has. So as I said, so quite rich, uh, rich, rich examples. Uh, this is actually was just a couple examples how we use. Uh, we also uh, are doing some research in terms of analytics. So how to use Elasticsearch uh, for analytic purpose, purposes. We are still, uh, we are still uh, investigating how we can uh, use Elastic products uh, better uh, in terms of security. Uh, monitoring, uh, and yeah, it was just a couple examples. If you want to know more how, how we use and uh, our plans, how we are going to use, maybe, I don't know, some uh, our experience uh, in terms of uh, elastic, so just catch me up, I'm will be here around the venue. And this was it, this is it for, 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 for now, from me. And traditionally, it has been just a uh, swivel chair or swivel tap uh, debugging, going through different tools rather than collecting everything in a centralized tool. What we're also seeing is, is uh, the move from, uh, from the monolithic application uh, to tiered applications uh, into microservices, and of course also uh, uh, latest edition is going into the serverless world. Uh, with that move and uh, you know uh, orchestration, you see parts coming up, going down, and so forth. And what you really get is move to this, which makes it even harder, right? So we need some tool to be able to help us out. Now the traditional status quo has been that that and uh, okay, and now it's really loud. <laughs> Uh, has been and, and still is in, 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 uh, in many companies is that you have, uh, you have your operations team doing something with a logging tool, you have uh, another metrics tool that you're using, you've got dev and they're using uh, some kind of APM tool, probably a little bit of logging and maybe not the same team or the same tool as the op team is using and then you have some uptime tool but you don't have kind of a single view of all that data. And to us, observability is just another search use case. So you want to be able to search across all of that data. And we see, we see the power of combining all of the data within a single tool. So you have all the log data, all the me metrics, all the APM stuff in a si single tool. Um, yeah, I'm good. So, Elastic stack for logs is basically where we were, where we, oh, yeah. Shai Bannon, our CEO, started with doing recipe searches, but then uh, there was a guy doing Logstash and a guy doing Kibana, and that was basically where it started. Centralized logging is where we started. Uh, <coughs> we added modules for the ingestion of data uh, to our beats, so simplifying getting data in to Elastic um, is something that we added. Uh, another thing is the uh, ability for frozen indices and also, as you mentioned, the index lifecycle management to help you move from one tier to the other uh, from in, in hot, warm, cold architecture. Uh, and then Logs UI is also something, uh, and I'll show you in a demo, so I'll skip a little fast across that. For metrics, we have metric beat, We've got Visual Builder for time series data. We can ingest Prometheus data. And we also have an infrastructure view uh, for metrics. 
in terms of APM, so APM is kind of local. Um, so I'm based out of Copenhagen, so is Thomas. Uh, and actually, uh, APM was an acquisition of a company called Upbeat, based out of Copenhagen, uh, founded in Copenhagen. Uh, and that's the uh, foundation of the Elastic APM solution. Uh, so APM is everybody, somebody, is there someone here who's not aware of what APM is? So application performance monitoring, looking at how your application performs in, in, uh, in the concept or construct of Elastic, uh, we see APM uh, as uh, usually auto-instrumented. So we auto-instrument uh, HTTP communication, we auto-instrument uh, any database access, depending on which agent you're using, but generally speaking. Uh, in terms of agents available, we start all the way out with uh, real user monitoring in the browser and moving in uh, and covering most of the general languages. Heard you mention PHP. Uh, that is something that is being looked very much at because you can see it's not here. So, so what? We have. We have. I don't. I don't know exactly when, but yeah, PHP is 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 not forgotten. You could say. <laughs> um, then the other tool we also have as part of the ob observability is uptime. So basically, we have a a beat called heartbeat that can just ping a site, log in, and constantly check for the availability of the site from wherever. You can also, if you want to check it from different locations. You can add a location to the heartbeat. So you can tell, so this heartbeat is checking from Copenhagen, this heartbeat is checking from Tokyo, and you can see if the site is available from all over the place. And the heart, uh, heartbeat data is then ingested into Elasticsearch, and you can see it in the uptime UI. Um, one important thing to cover here, and it goes across both the Security use case, uh, uh, but also the observability use case, is Elastic Common Schema. So what Elastic Common Schema is, is basically just a naming convention. It's the naming of fields, but it means that, and all our beats adhere to, the, to this naming convention, meaning that all data ingested, so for instance, a source IP will always be a source IP. It doesn't matter whether it comes from a, from a firewall, whether it comes from... Uh, uh, some Windows event uh, it with uh, coming in with Winlock beat, the naming convention is the same, and that means that you can search across all of your data uh, from uh, uh, from all the data you have ingested and have full visibility of what's going on with the data. So with that, I'm going to jump into demo. Um, quickly going to cover what we are looking at here. So this is a, uh, I think it's called Hipster, Hipster Shop. It's a Google uh, Kubernetes-based, uh, just a, a demo application that they've done that we refactored with uh, our own APM instead. In terms of what and, and how we are monitoring, I mean, all the different services here have been, uh, the APM agent have been added to it. If we can see here, the Redis cache that sits in the service is uh, instrumented with file beat and metric beat, meaning looking at the logs, looking at uh, metrics from Redis. Uh, all across in Kubernetes, we have file beat and metric beat sitting as a daemon set. So actually picking up all the logs that are coming off of the different services uh, automatically and adding on metadata like uh, container ID and so forth being basically automatically added uh, into, uh, into this. 
I was going a little quickly through the slides or any questions so far on observability? Nope. So <coughs> this is basically just to demo our uh, uh, Slack integration. We can integrate, uh, so on alerting we can integrate on uh, it can be on uh, or when we alert, the alert can go through, you can send an email, you can integrate with Slack, uh, or we have a lot of other integrations, and if there's no integration that you think directly fits you, we just anything you have with the REST API, because we can just do a simple webhook. So we can basically integrate with, with most things. Uh, so what's happening here is that we get a warning uh, for a high mean transaction duration, I'm not sure you can read it from them. This is a high mean transaction duration for the front end. And this is actually just, uh, it's a machine learning job. So as part of our commercial offerings, we have machine learning, unsupervised machine learning so far, uh, that can uh, look at, uh, so we have this default job, for instance, looking at just the, uh, transaction duration for APM data. That's out of the box something that's en enabled that you can alert on. So it just says that there's been a high mean in the transaction duration and we can press the link. There's a link here and that will take us into our anomaly explorer. So we can see here that there's a uh, just here, if we look at it here, so basically, I mean, we calculate a, a probability. Based on that probability, we do a severity score from zero to 100 because the probability is just a strange decimal number, right? That's impossible to use. So, and based off of that, we bucket it into one major, uh, minor, major, or critical. Uh, and color code accordingly. And here we can see that there's already been somebody in, uh, seen that there's an issue, uh, and tagged it with new deployment. So the, assuming that, the, okay, the transaction duration problem, potentially just because we did the deployment and it just has to settle, right? You know, so this is the new deployment, just has to settle. But what we can see now is, well, there's still something going on at least. Uh, it, it doesn't look like it, it fell into a normal groove uh, uh, like here. Right, so we can go in and take a look. Uh, and from, from the Anomaly Explorer, we can go directly into uh, doing an APM, take an APM view, an APM analysis, of the problem. Uh, and if we look, look here, we could see time spent by span type, uh, transaction duration. And we see the new deployment came out here and we can see that there is, it, something happened at least on the transaction duration. Uh, I'm not sure you can read it from here, but the blue that's the average, and you can actually see, well, maybe there's a little bit of drop in the average. But the interesting thing is you see, especially for the 99th and also for the 95th percentile, you see an increase in the transaction duration. Um, so that could tell us that the one or two services are running you know, somehow shaky, uh, but it's because the average isn't directly impacted, it's probably not all services that, are, uh, that, that have an issue. Um, so oh, I need to get out of this full screen. Yeah. So I can go back and I've gotten another alert. Uh, so first warning I got was from the front end. Saw an issue, right? Uh, I'll just make it bigger. Uh, now I get another wa warning coming from the ad service. Same thing, high mean transaction duration for the ad service. I can go into the link, see what's going on. Uh, 
and it's basically, you know, it, it's, it's a similar story. So we've got the new deployment and we can see things didn't really settle back into a kind of a normal groove. It's also one thing to mention here on the, uh, the anomaly explorer is that you see, so the, the blue line you see is data coming in, the transaction duration. The light blue is the machine learning models, the statistical model assumption of what the data should look like. And you can see it'll follow, so the spike here will make it okay, probably it'll, it'll then, oh, it's a touch screen. <laughs> How do I get out of that? Outside of where? <laughs> it's smart. It's too smart for me. <laughs> ah, it's gone. Okay, I won't touch it again. I'll, I'll keep. I'll keep my distance. <laughs> So, but you can see here that you get, we, we start to get some anomalies, not any that are severe. We get one here that's severe, right? Um, but we see, and we see the, the statistical model is starting to expand itself as it sees data change. Um, so, and somebody has annotated this with it's happened after the new deployment. Um, we can go in and analyze again, go into the uh, APM service. There was actually also, just wanted to highlight another thing. The other thing we could do was jump into, so we have uh, a new visualization called Lens, Kibana Lens. Has anybody looked at that? Uh, I think I'll cover it in the security part if, if we have time. So actually it can be used for, it's meant as a visualization, an easy tool to make a visualization, but it can also be used to do debugging and security investigations, and I'll show that. So here we see, again, time spent by t span type. We can see the new deployment coming in. Uh, got a little blip here, and then, and, and if we try to zoom in here, see a similar story that it didn't really it didn't really go back to normal right there is some change in the transaction duration um, and we can go into I think also uh, here if we look here see the other thing that we can see when we zoom into this this high peak of the transaction duration, we actually see this, okay, this, so there's a period of time where we see no transactions, which is also kind of, it's not good. Um, and the other thing we see out here, right, as, as we miss transactions, we also see some degradation of service, and we see the request per minute dropping. So there's some things going on. So I can jump into the get ads here. Um, and here I'm just presented with uh, the ad service, what's going on in the ad service. You can see here that, you know, there's a post against Elasticsearch. Uh, you can see the durations and so forth. Uh, what we actually also can do is that we can jump into the full trace. So I can jump into viewing the full trace. So here we get, you know, all the stuff going on. So, so, and if we, I'll scroll up here again. So what we can see here is that it's a full distributed tracing where we can see it actually going through the different other services and it being color coded. So we can see, you know, you know, I, I see what's going on in, in, in the transaction. Um, and again, we can also see the change happening here. Um, so if I just jump back here, back. So, you know, we also have errors listed that will be listed by default. You see there's no errors here. If, so for instance, uh, if I had a 200 or a 400, 
uh, HTTP that would pop up here and we could go in and investigate that error. You see, okay, because I was thinking, okay, stuff missing and so could it be, could it be an error uh, downright? But it doesn't seem to be. So I can also, so apart from picking up metrics with metric beats, so directly uh, in this case, this is Kubernetes, uh, container uh, metrics, uh, the agents are also picking up information from their own, you could say their own service context. So, so in this case, uh, with it being a Java application, it picks up JVM metrics uh, from its own context. Uh, so in the ad service part, it actually picks up the metrics from the JVM. So I can go into that and take a look. Um, and I can see the little blurb here on CPU usage as the new deployment came in. Uh, but what's also interesting, when I start to look at the heap memory, I can see that there's a jump here, and there's another jump, and then after that jump, it drops off totally, indicating out of memory. So potentially we, we're looking at some kind of out of memory error here, here. We also see the thread count is not really changing, uh, but we see the garbage collection time spent per minute is crawling through the roof uh, as is garbage collection per minute. So this could be related to something uh, uh, some memory leak, right? So if we go back into the uh, into the transaction, uh, we can we can again do different things, jump to different other places in the data. Uh, we can jump to show pod metrics. And we can just expand the time frame a little bit here. So what we can see here at least is that, okay, so there's no data here. So why weren't there no data here? Potentially, probably because this pod wasn't up at that time. So it's probably, again, if we're talking, if it's, uh, if it's an out of memory, the pod could potentially be crashed. And this is just a new pod spinning up with high CPU utilization, uh, just as it spins up. Uh, but we also see the memory usage. Again, we see that climbing, and then we see it dropping off. So again, something indicating that there's some kind of memory leak uh, in the service. Um, so what we can do again from the transaction, say, okay, let's, let's take a look at the uh, logs for this part um, and see if there's something, you know, jumping directly in our faces. Um, So, and it'll automatically, it'll take the context, it'll bring in the context uh, it had. So in this case, it will bring in, uh, it will bring in uh, the, uh, the part UID by default. Uh, but as I am thinking, it could be something heap related. Let's uh, see if I, okay. So, Terminating due to Java Lang out of memory, Java heap space. There is at least, again, it does actually crash because of out of memory. Um, so we can try to analyze why does it do that. Um, so again, cache miss here seems kind of interesting. What we can do is if we want to, you know, see see that through, we can highlight 
Uh, and we see every time there's a cache miss, there's adding two items to cache, and it's counting. So probably, you know, it's something related to the cache miss, uh, and uh, and therefore it runs out of memory because it just keeps adding uh, uh, items to the cache. Uh, some other things to look at in here uh, while we're here is the uh, this is logs UI. Uh, in beta, we have a uh, feature that uh, where we it uses uses our machine learning uh, to look at uh, anomalies in the logs by default. So you don't have to do anything; it's just enabled by default and analyze and you can alert based on it. So we can see here that there's some uh, anomalies popping up for, uh, for the data. Um, and we can actually, if I go here, you can see that it's something related to the ready slow lock. And if we wanted to, we could go and analyze further uh, in uh, machine learning. you know then the uh, anomalies is is popping up there um, what we uh, further can do is is we can um, uh, if we wanted to jump back to the original uh, issue is that we actually have a uh, jumping into dashboards here so apart from what you can do just by default out of the box. Um, we've also made, you know, an other view of, of, of the same data in a dashboard here where you can analyze looking at the logs, you get annotations of, you know, this is email services down so forth. Uh, here you get an annotation of ad services down. As like a, a single pane of glass, we get information from, uh, from the logs and so forth. We can actually see here that there's a, I uh, don't know if how clear, uh, I think it's fairly clear to see here. There's actually a drop in APM data as the uh, uh, ad service part is, is cutting out. Um, and we got a, um, uh, a UI down here combining everything. So looking at the uh, SLA for the services uh, combined with uh, CPU and memory usage. And we can actually uh, dive into just the ad service here. Just needs to update. So here we can actually, through the metrics, we can see the, the, the memory going through the roof. Uh, we can see uh, performance degradation in, uh, in the APM performance. And we can also see the uh, memory going up uh, and, and the uh, uh, SLA degradation uh, in the service. So, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. So, what is the key to your actual investment? Based on anomalies, I guess. So, based on anomalies. Okay, I mean, the average, you are the system taking the average and taking the anomalies. Based on that, uh, a few years ago, we had some requirement, some intelligent system which tracks the anomalies with in the metrics and cross-checking it and we couldn't find it at those times we checked even Elasticsearch EL key segment but we, what we needed so for example in your case it's, it's obvious was memory leak but <coughs> uh, in our case for example the transaction was slowed down maybe it was because of the network so the case was to check the network and tell that, okay, there is an anomaly, but it may be because of the network. 
So uh, in some intelligent learning or guided system, it's APM can do that or Elasticsearch. So everything separately and based on animal is what you show till that moment. Yeah, so, so it was based off of anomalies and I, I'm just, uh, if I just jump back here, if I can do that without every screen freaking out, I think I can do it from here. So, and I mean, your, your first question around anomalies. So, so the actual alert that came in was based off of the uh, default job, machine learning job within Elastic that checks for a change in the mean uh, transaction duration. It's obvious, it's average, and the difference between the average is anomalies, you can call it. It's based on change, but I'm, check, I'm asking for some cross metrics anomalies detection. Like, ah, there's some changes there that may cause that change. So it may be a chain causes, it is machine learning. What you are telling is very mathematical, not the machine learning. Practically, it's a statistical uh, animal. It is, it is statistical, yeah. I mean, most unsupervised machine learning is just statistics. Yeah, most of them. But so, so, so yes, it's just statistics. Mm -hmm. But it's, and you can say, yes, you can just look at it. But uh, in case that, I mean, for instance, you infer a load every Friday afternoon to the system. You go from uh, 100 users to 2 million users for some reason. Let's say it's, I don't know football or something that incurs that load and it's every Friday if you put in a simple alert I know it's just simple statistics but if you put in a simple alert and you put in a threshold your system will be slower and the, 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 the communication will be slower and as it happens every Friday our machine learning won't trigger on it if that makes sense so it's still looking at the pattern of the data Yes, we are coming out with some uh, where you can start to do supervised machine learning. It depends on how much data you have, so of course. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. But, but yeah, the more complex cases, the more the cases that are looking where you need, where you could see you need to, you could say you need to guide the system, we are coming out with uh, machine learning that can do that also. Yes. Uh, so jumping to security analytics, oh yeah, it's always slow. Any further questions on, on the observability? Yeah, go ahead. supervised learning I was curious uh, like if we have a scenario where one anomaly is a cause for a chain of like following anomalies is there some way to uh, make the system know about this like hey this is the cause and this is a consequence and there is this like cost to consequence transition and whenever something happens, just point the cost, not everything that is triggered by it. Not off the top of my head at the moment. <laughs> but again, it's uh, 7.6 is a release where we, we are investing heavily in the machine learning also, releasing some of the work that's been done in machine learning. Whether you could potentially use some of it to do what you're talking about, I, I don't know, 100%. Uh, but not, not directly, no. Thank you. Okay, so when, when talking security, uh, one of the things, we acquired a company called Endgame. So apart from 
having a CM app, we actually also have endpoints. So why we're observing, why not protect? Uh, so we can do endpoint protection on, uh, uh, on uh, Windows and Mac OS. Uh, Linux, we can do detections. Um, but we can actually have endpoints actively uh, work on, uh, on Windows and Mac, actually actively prevent. Oh, come on. Um, yeah, so, so uh, anyone here familiar with the MITRE attack framework? No. So basically, uh, the concept of the MITRE attack framework is, is moving from uh, the traditional, you know, just looking at, at uh, if I move here, just looking at, it basically is a, is a framework of, of uh, uh, malicious behavior. So looking at adversary behaviors, and traditionally uh, we've been focused a lot in this area, which is execution. So basically just looking at a digest of a file. The signature of a file is it malicious or not. Uh, but what attackers are doing today is basically they are uh, doing live of the lands attacks. So they are using Windows native tools to do their attacks. Detecting these attacks uh, can be much harder. Uh, our endpoints are really good at detecting attacks like that. They have built in uh, machine learning to detect and can act autonomously uh, on the system. Uh, apart from that, we are also with our CM app, uh, we have with 7.6 released something called detection rules. A lot of the out of the box detection rules that we come, uh, we deliver, they uh, align to the MITRE attack framework also. So we also on the uh, CM end is, is looking at the MITRE attack framework. Um, this probably looks familiar because now we're just talking from a security analytics standpoint, but it's the same thing. Different tools across uh, different teams uh, within the organization, and therefore you do not have the full vis uh, visibility uh, into the system. And uh, again, it's about combining all of the data into a single system so you can start to look across all of the system. Uh, and uh, even as part of that story, or uh, you can look at it isolated from an observability point of view, you can look at it isolated from a security point of view, or you can say that a lot of the data that you're collecting in, in observability is actually data that can be logs that can be used in security, vice versa. So why double ingest uh, the information when you actually only need it once? So also combining security and observability and using the same tool across those two actually makes sense uh, in, my, in our minds. Um, so yeah, prevent, detect and respond. And we have, uh, so you could say, we have the offering of uh, elastic endpoint security sitting on, uh, on, on endpoints and I do an active uh, protection. Uh, they can also collect uh, data and take that data and stream that into Elasticsearch. And they will do it in the ECS format that we talked about earlier. So you can both ingest data from you know, using traditional beats or you can use the endpoint to ingest data to get information about uh, or get your security information into the system. And then you can analyze it in CM, or we actually also have a, an endpoint platform where you can analyze it. Yeah. <clears throat> so again, yeah. Beats and um, endpoints can ingest the data. And what you can also do and what we have customers doing is, I mean, one of the things that uh, we have customers using Logstash for, and there's also some things in the demo, is... Uh, you can, uh, for instance, have MISP data sitting. So you directly, when upon ingest, you're comparing against MISP data and enriching with, you know, known bad IPs or so forth. Uh, directly, the data comes from the beats routed through Logstash and then into Elasticsearch. Um. 
I just need some water. I've been talking too much. <coughs> so, yeah, and the, then we have, uh, again, back to what Thomas was talking about earlier. We want to lower the barrier of entry for security analytics. People have been using Elastic for security analytics for a very, lo very long time, but we want to uh, make that easier and enable people uh, to, to easier get started with Elastic. And that's why we released the CM app, and I'll, I'll show some things about it. So again, in the interest of time, jumping into a demo. This doesn't, this also shows the CM app, but it more shows you know, the complete platform of just doing uh, 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 an attack analysis. This is a retrospective uh, attack analysis. So um, this guy, is a disgruntled employee from a company called Swift Crypto. He's been fired and he wants to get back at HR. Uh, so on the dark web, he finds a pawn uh, uh, pawned credentials from uh, Jacob Doe, uh, who unfortunately reuses his password uh, across both uh, you know, his private email and, and also his uh, work. So that's how he gains access. Uh, when he starts the attack, he puts out a smoke screen. And since this being a Swift Crypto is a, is a Bitcoin company, they, uh, of course, keep an eye on credit cards being detected. And, based off, and he knows that because he's a, he's a former employee, former developer. So he knows that they, that will be looked at. So he uses that to put out a smoke screen. Then he crashes audit beat to cover his tracks. Uh, and we have a sore restart of that. Uh, then Jacob Doe, AKA the hacker, uh, logs in from vacation, uh, creates a certificate to make a, an HR site to do a phishing attack uh, and uh, uh, fishes the credential of an HR employee uh, called Jane Doe. Uh, So all of that uh, is coming off of, uh, again, we've, we've got some uh, um, Slack alerts coming in here, but you know, we can integrate with, you know, however you want it. But in this case, we just integrated with, uh, with Slack. So here we get the possible credit card number has been detected, and I can jump into that alert. It'll take me into a web application firewall, uh, dashboard. So again, back to the modules that come with the beats, they actually uh, have different custom dashboards for things. This is just a web application firewall dashboard, but different dashboards that will help you visualize the data that is ingested from, from that specific thing. And in this case, we can see that, you know, we're using our maps feature to highlight from where the attacks come from, and we can see it's a, it, it, it's a, a single point. Uh, the data being ingested, uh, so we can go in here and look at that, so we can see which URL it's, it's talking to. It's trying to get into a login PHP. It's getting a 404. Uh, and the data being ingested is being, has been enriched in different ways. Uh, is it too hard to see? Shall I make it bigger? Was there a yes? yes also yes. Okay. Just need to scroll it. Here we go. So we get the client IP. Uh, and if I scroll down here, uh, we are using uh, ASN enrichment to, uh, to pinpoint from where the data is coming. We are GUIP enriching it. I'll just see here. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here is ESN information, so we can see it's digital. Uh, the, the login attempt here comes from DigitalOcean, which is a hosting provider, which is kind of strange. Uh, we can see the geolocation that's again being enriched in Logstash. Um, 
we can see, and it's been tagged with a possible credit card number. We can also see that the usage in this curl, so again, kind of suspicious. Uh, so what we can do here is uh, we can block the IP. Uh, so this basically is just a scripted field that will take the IP address and send it to the firewall uh, to block it. So now we block the IP. Um, and now we come back and there's a low count of audit beat events detected. So I can jump into that alert. And it will take me into uh, the Anomaly Explorer. Let's make it a little smaller again. Um, and what it tells me is that there's an unexpected zero value. Now, no, again, back to what you were saying, unexpected zero value isn't the hardest one to detect, I know, but in this case, it's still, uh, uh, there's an unexpected uh, zero value, and we can view the audit beat data to kind of verify uh, what's going on. And we can see here there was no data coming in. We can also see, you know, what's been going on, uh, which audit beat data has been coming in. Um, we can also, we have a, um, go here and verify, as I said before, it was a saw action that uh, uh, reopened it. So I can go here and I have a safe search here that I can go in and I can verify that audit beat started by Logstash Pipeline. So it's been restarted again by the saw action. Uh, and I can also verify that the IP has been blocked. Um, so again, not much more I can do on that. And then there's a login from a user on vacation detected. And basically, with this, uh, this is uh, this data is oh, what happened? this data is enriched through um, Logstash again. So it uses uh, uh, I don't remember ODBC or JDBC to access a SQL database and check whether the users logging in are actually on vacation. Verify so, and of course, we'll alert on somebody on vacation logging in. The other thing, uh, back to the have I been pawned, we are actually uh, checking against have I been pawned uh, on ingest to see if the user has been pawned because then there's of course a possibility that the password, there's a password reuse. Uh, uh, so, so that's possible to, to log in. Uh, so um, let's see here the other thing, and here we can see the username and so forth. Um, and I can go investigate further in the CM app. So now we get into the CM app. Just a little smaller again. And we get some different, here we can just see the, the host. In this case, there's, because it is actually already taking the context of Jacob Doe and the specific server because this context is being brought in. So, so there's of course not a lot to see here. We can go into uh, authentications and again, there'll only be Jacob Doe, but we can start an investigation now by just taking Jacob Doe and we can drag him onto the timeline here, which is the investigation tool. Um, the other thing that could be interesting to see is is there any uncommon processes that he has been using? Well, yeah, less pipe, that's probably not the most normal thing to use, unless he's, a, unless he's an uh, administrator. Uh, and here we can actually see that he's been, he's created, run a script that's, I don't know if you can read it, but it says create DNS and CRT.sh. So, Again, suspicious, probably not good. 
Um, uh, one of th and, and this timeline is something that I can, I can save it. I can also, if it's uh, our own InfoSec team is, is, so we're taking our own medicines or our own InfoSec team is using it. They've implemented with uh, the watch watcher alerting. So if, if one of them writes, say, uh, at John, can you please check? And I add the note. Uh, the alerting uh, watch alert will actually uh, trigger a Slack message to John in in the security Slack channel. Uh, so he'll get he'll get notified to take a look at at this timeline with the link to the timeline and can jump into the timeline uh, and start to investigate. Um, So, another thing I just want to show while we are here. Uh, I'm just going to remove this and go back to authentications. Let's see. Uh, what else? So again, when 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 looking at at Elastic, I know it's probably very. It's you can see the number of digits here for events that you've gotten in a security investigation in the matter of I don't know how many seconds, but you can do a very wide search. This was login for the last 15 years of root. You can do a very wide search, and then you start narrowing in, and it's not like okay, I'm going to do this search, and then I'm going to come back tomorrow, and then I'm going to check. Uh, so back to talking about speed, scale, and relevance. It's the difference between uh, whether you contain a breach or whether it's actually going to be a real problem for you. And here you can start with the wide search and you can narrow it in, and the searches actually uh, are fast. Um, so integrated into the CM app also is uh, a set of anomaly detections, different anomaly detections looking at uh, so, for instance, this one is anomalous network port activity. So, again, looking at your normal behavior in the network, and is there then anything standing out? Are you doing something different? Uh, and that's being looked at, and you can just turn these jobs on and on, on and off, and get alerts uh, off of those jobs. The other thing we released uh, with 7.6 is detections. So this is basically detection rules, um, and I can go into managing here. So we can just take, and again, so we had like 24 anomaly detections. Currently, uh, there's 92 released uh, detection rules coming from us. We have a team of engineers working on that, uh, but there will be more coming and there are more in our uh, dev setup. Uh, you can also do your own custom rules. Uh, we jump into one custom rule here and just go into edit. So basically here you can with uh, Kibana query language, you can just write something and again it'll auto complete for you and so forth. Be able to write up a rule. Um, and As I talked about previously with the MITRE attack framework, you're able to align it with the MITRE attack framework. I need to, oh. But getting back to the thing at hand, we drop the, drop the new certificate detected, but we'll go into the impossible travel. So here again, he created a he created a uh, 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 the, the attacker created a certificate. 
uh, created a, uh, a certificate for HR at Swift Crypto, so it'll look genuine for his login. Um, and and uh, we can now see that there's an possible travel detected. So uh, Jane Doe lo locked in from both the uh, US and UK. Um, and again, we have a suspicion of it being from a phishing email. So we can, we have this fuzzy email search. So it's just a safe search where we can actually see that we're looking for uh, something that's very similar to Swift Crypto. And I need to make this a little bit bigger so you can see, but it's actually coming from an email coming from Swift Crypto instead. And it comes, it's a new HR portal being sent to Jane Doe. So again, uh, kind of a smoking gun. The last thing we can do to verify that, oops, to verify that uh, it's actually not the same, uh, the same login from the same client is that you can use something called a JA3 hash to verify, takes stuff off the TLS client and make sure that it doesn't come from the same client. So again, here we verified that it's not coming from the same client. So last thing I just wanted to show uh, is Kibana Lens. So I talked about it previously. Uh, so this takes, um, he would take, we, we know that there has been a security incident and we know it's somewhere between uh, December 10 and January 15. But we don't know exactly, you know, we just, or we suspect that there's been. And here in Lens, we can start by, well, let's look at, we're looking at packet beat data here. Let's, let's look at the number of uh, packets coming in. Uh, or records coming in. Oh shit. Hold on. This one. Ah. Now the demo demon is coming for me. And we can take, uh, we can actually take that. So we're looking at, there's nothing really popping up here. We try to filter it by source IP. We take the Top five values. It's not the right link. Hold on. This needs to reload it. Basically, Lynch, you're able to, you can drag, just drag data that you want to analyze into Lynch. Here we go. So we can see there's a spike of data. Uh, looks kind of odd, count of records over 12 hours is much higher than the others, but you know, let's look at it from what if we look at it? Are there any specific source IPs that are suspicious? So I can drag that in there too. Oh, it doesn't pop out anything, but let's, you know, 
increase. Okay, now there's a single, there's an 89, 248, 147 that has really high, um, uh, you know, pops up a lot of times. Um, one of the things that if it's an attacker, what ob often destination happens right is that they do a port scan. So let's see if we put in the uh, port also. And we look at the unique count of ports. Okay, it's teasing me right now. Well, what you'll be able to see when you drag it in, you can actually see that there's 60,000 ports being scanned. But it's, it's, it's meant as a visualization to design visualizations, but what you can al actually also use it for is to uh, do investigations. Uh, and I've shown it here. The other thing we saw with the heap, you can actually also detect the heap uh, going up uh, and the SLA changes uh, along with the heap going up in about where you could say the reason for changing is that uh, one of the reasons it's probably many but at least one of the reasons that I know of is also uh, the ability to make an alert that is isolated to a specific user group or a specific user and that's part of the Kibana security model and that's what we wanted that that's why it sits there, I think, or the one of the reasons why it sits in Kibana rather than Elasticsearch is that it's taking the Kibana security model, meaning that whatever context you are locked in as can be set with, you, you can then see these rules. Now, the current detection rules, you can see all of them, but the idea is to have being able to mask out separate rules for separate teams and so forth. Other questions? Well, I hope it was uh, useful. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs>